So today I'm going to be doing the rounds with MC David Diamante, who's locking down in New York. How are things stateside? Hi, Anna. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, actually. I'm keeping keeping busy and, and trying to stay as well as I can. How about you? How are things over there in New York? You know, New York has been a little bit tough. A lot of people are sick, so we're trying to get through it. But as far as for myself, I've been really busy. I've been staying safe and sheltering at home, wearing a mask, washing my hands. And, you know, thank God right now everything's good. And you've got the new addition. We have a beard. I know this is the quarantine the beard. It's the new beard. look. It's the lockdown <laughs> beard. Yeah, we don't know if it'll stay yet, but you know, <laughs> it's kind of a the new addition. I say keep the beard, David. I'm loving it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'll take right, that into are consideration. To, are you ready to do this? This is six three minute rounds. The answer, the aim of the game oh, is to answer as many questions. Yeah, get I love it, it. Six, as you six, can. Six three minute rounds. I, I'm saying, you know. Look, if I get this, if I do this right, maybe we can move up to eight. Then we'll get the regional 10 and then we'll do the world championship 12 rounder. <laughs> so let's start at the six. I'm ready to go. <laughs> let's do it. Let's start at six. All right. Okay. Round one is life before boxing. Let's go. Uh, what were you like as a child, David? Oh, wow. That's just a really open, open question there. Huge. Um, what was I like as a child? Uh, very curious, kind of like I am now, always trying to learn, but I was always getting into trouble. Uh, very adventurous. Um, Loved uh, music, loved skateboarding, loved sports, um, played soccer, played uh, American football, played uh, baseball, played basketball, a um, lot, of, lot of street fights, um, uh, just all kinds of stuff. Always very active. You know, a lot of people, uh, the young people now, they don't realize we didn't even have the video games. You had to go to the arcade back then. So this was pre-Atari, pre-Nintendo, not even alone the Xbox. So we didn't have any of that. So it was old school fun, old school fun, outside with the guys uh, playing sports. What was the dream? What, what did you want to be when you grew up when you were a child? True story, I actually wanted to be a garbage man. <laughs> I'm not no, even lying. Oh, really? Yeah, and my <laughs> mom hated that. that because I, I loved how they got to hang on the back of the truck and they got to throw things in and crush them. And I thought that was really cool. So I always wanted to be a garbage man, but now I don't really have those aspirations. But when I was a kid, true story, that's what I wanted to be. My mom wanted me to be a doctor, but uh, it wasn't to be. So from garbage man to uh, MC, how did it happen? <laughs> well, it's a long story. It wasn't a straight trajectory. I mean, I was also, a, I was a professional drummer for many years. Uh, I moved out to California and I played in a lot of bands out there. Um, I even gave drum lessons to the guitarist of Metallica, Kirk, Kirk Hammett. Um, played in a bunch of bands. Uh, played in a band called Shark Bait that had just gotten off tour in Lollapalooza in 1994. Um, and then I became a DJ and I DJed uh, a lot of the top clubs in California and New York, all over, all over America and all over the world. And that was really great for me. But always in my life, I loved boxing. That was from a very, very young age. It was always my favorite sport. You know, why, as a why kid, was that? Sugar Ray Leonard. So I had a few heroes as a kid. Evil Knievel, definitely one of them. And for the people out there that don't know, I'm a big motorcycle rider. So uh, Evil Knievel was was my guy. Um, I love the Fonz, you know, Fonzie on Happy Days. He was cool. He was always riding a yeah. motorcycle. Um, I love Pele. I loved Pele because I, I loved soccer. Uh, you know, what you guys call football, soccer. I loved Pele, but I loved Sugar Ray Leonard. He was one of my heroes. And he still is. He's still my favorite fighter of all time. He's just an amazing man. I know him very well now and spent quite a lot of time with him. But as a kid, uh, he was my favorite fighter. And I just, I, I thought he was the best. We're running out of time in this round, but I want to know, how did you get into MC and David? So I did some boxing and, uh, you know, I just figured that's not going to be my calling because I actually started fighting a little bit late and I decided that you know, I'd be a much better MC, and I think that was definitely the case. <laughs> so you don't fancy stepping in the ring then? Well, I, I always like to mix it up. I'm always down to do that. Um, I've, I've had some pretty bad motorcycle accidents, uh, and so I've had quite a lot of injuries. I, I broke this arm in eight pieces recently. Um, that happened just a couple years ago. Um, and uh yeah I've, i had another one i dislocated my shoulder so that that's kind of hurt my my boxing career so but i still like yeah, to move that. around so 
Yeah, I'd probably say stay away from actually boxing with all those injuries. Not a good idea at all. Right, let's move in <laughs> to round two, which is your career. Um, your style of emceeing, David, it's it's kind of a nod to the old school, isn't it? Who inspired you? So really, I'll say three guys. My top favorite MC of all time is a guy named Ed Darien. And second, I would say, would be Mark Biro. And third would be probably Johnny Addy. So Johnny Addy was the old school announcer at Madison Square Garden. And it really just, he was the most class. I mean, just an incredible announcer. And Ed Darien, he did a lot of the fights in Atlantic City and uh, in the Philadelphia area. And he was just wonderful. And Mark Biro out of Florida. Um, Mark Biro is the only one that's alive right now. And I got to induct Johnny Addy into the New York State Boxing Hall of Fame, which is a big thrill for me. I, I, I gave a nice speech. And um, Ed Darien, he's passed, but uh, I'm friends with his son. And uh, so it's kind of a great thing. And all of those guys did the double surnames. And that was that's where I came up listening to it. And I always loved it. And also even the, the Yankees announcer, uh, Bob Shepard, um, the voice of God, you know, he used to say, coming to the plate, number two, Derek Jeter, Jeter. So he, he was, you know, he would do the double sermon. I just, I, maybe it's a New York thing, but uh, I always loved it. It made sense to me. And the other thing, I think the fighters, they're giving everything in the ring. They're putting their lives on the line. And when you say the name the first time, you know, Joshua, everyone's cheering at that moment. And sometimes it's, it gets lost in the, in the, it gets drowned out. So when you say it the second time, it just cuts through. And I think the fighters deserve that. So I love to do that for them. I've got so many questions to ask you, David. That, that's something that I always get asked about you is, is why does David Diamante always repeat the surname? But now we know. Um, what's, what's the biggest fight that you've emceed in your career, do you think? Oh, there's been quite a few. I mean, uh, I did the WBC welterweight championship of the world with Andre Berto and Victor Ortiz at the MGM on HBO World Championship Boxing. Um, I did the undisputed unified cruiserweight championship of the world in Moscow at the Olympic Stadium with... Oleksandr Usyk and Marat Gassiev, um, George Groves and uh, and Chris Eubank Jr. Uh, in Manchester. You guys probably remember that fight. That was a, a yeah. man, what a buzzing night, buzzing night. But like, you know, the nights at Wembley with Joshua in Saudi Arabia, that, that was incredible. Uh, just recently, um, obviously with Joshua Ruiz 2 or, or Joshua Ruiz 1 at Madison Square Garden. There's just been so many great fights over the years. And, and I've been lucky enough to, to actually call two fights of the year. One was the Berto Ortiz uh, one that became the fight of the year. And the second one was Pavel Wallach and Delvin Rodriguez. They fought on ESPN at the Roseland Ballroom, which is now no longer uh, in existence. But that became the ESPN fight of the year. It was an incredible uh, fight. Um, and uh, I don't know if you ever saw like Haseem Rockman with the big hematoma, the Pavel Wallach had kind of the same type of thing. It looked like a, a grapefruit was under his eye, but the yeah. fight continued and it was it was a high drama affair. We've run out of time, but I'm going to keep asking you questions. Um, do you get nervous <laughs> before, you, before you do it? And, and how do you rehearse? Are you in your hotel room practicing with a tube of toothpaste? What, what happens? <laughs> no, no, but you know, it's funny. I don't get, I don't get too nervous. I think, I think I feel really comfortable in front of the microphone. It's kind of like, it, it's, it's what I do. It's my job. And it's, it's the ring and having the mic and being in front of the mic. It's my office. Like, I love it. Th there might be a little bit of nerves right before. Um, some of those nerves sometimes come from the, the memorization because I do a lot of fights and there are a lot of specs to remember, not just about the fighters, but about the judges and the referees and the commission and the belts and the sanctioning bodies, uh, the sponsors. Um, sometimes the, the fight is in association with another promoter, not just the main promoter. Um, sometimes there's a, a weird tagline for an arena. So there's a lot to remember. So that can be a little bit unnerving. Um, but once, once the bright lights are on, for me, it's kind of like a fighter. I, to me, I believe, I truly believe a fight is one very far away from the bright lights. It's all about the training and the, the weeks and the months of training and the diet and the sparring. If you do that correctly, when you go into the ring, the fight is the easy part. And the same thing goes for a ring announcer. It takes a lot of prep that people don't see behind, behind the scenes. So when I step on to the stage, I know what I'm doing and I feel great and I can't wait to bring it to the crowd. And, and that's, 
that's why I think I'm a great announcer is because I love what I do so much. And it's, I hope it comes out to the fans. I really do. Cause I, I really always, love it. I'm, you always I, do I'm, an exceptional job, David, but I want to know, have, have there ever been any blunders, any bloopers? Yes, of course. Of course. I'm a human being. I mean, not many, not many, <laughs> but, but there have been, of course. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes, sometimes you, you get, you'll, you'll get wrong stuff. I mean, I've, I'm not going to say which commission, which fight, when it happened, what year, but I've, I've been given a scorecard where I read it and I said, this is, this is incorrect. It's just not correct. And I went to the head of the commission before I announced this was, like, this was actually a worldwide fight. This was on a, a major international network. And I told the commissioner, uh, can we please check the scorecards? And he, he said, no, oh, they're, they're correct. I said, please, can we take a look at it? And he, again, he was, he was very, no, everything's great. And I, I said, I really think you should look at this. And he did. He said, oh my God, these are totally wrong. <laughs> I said, that's what I, you know, so sometimes you try to catch them before that happens, but it's always about being a cat, trying to land on your feet, wearing a, a, a belt and your suspenders. So that way you're, you've always, if, if the suspenders break, your belt is holding your pants up. Exactly. I always describe it as a, a swan. You're kind of on the, on the top, you're swimming smoothly, but underneath you're, you're pedaling like bilio, aren't you? Perfect analogy. I love it. Well, ho <laughs> hopefully, ho hopefully everything is swan like, but if not, yes, then it can be like that. All right. Okay. Let's move on to round three. This is life after boxing. What, what's the end goal for you? Are you, I mean, you, you've appeared on some massive bills already and, and with Michael Buffer, is the end goal to kind of move into his shoes? No, no, never. My end goal. Well, first of all, as far as in boxing, uh, I'm not trying to fill anybody's shoes. I, I'm in my own a league of my own, I believe. Uh, I love Michael. I've known Michael for many, many years, and I have a ton of respect for him. Uh, he's a Hall of Famer, and uh, and deservedly so. Um, and it's it's absolutely uh, you know I'm made up to be able to work with him uh, on a weekly basis, or you know you know we work together not every week, but but on the big cards and. Um, Again, we have a great relationship. We talk on the phone. He texts me. We've talked during this this lockdown. But it's about being myself. I think being original is very important. Um, my style is very different than Michael's. Uh, as much as his style is wonderful, uh, I have my own style. And so I would never be trying to take anybody's shoes. Um, and really, I think my end goal is is really more than about myself. It's about boxing. So Obviously, boxing, as big as it is in the UK, it's still a fringe sport around the world. It doesn't get nearly the shine that, that others get, even in the UK. I mean, as big as boxing is, football just, you know, is, is way bigger. Uh, and in America, of course, the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, uh, NHL, they're all much bigger than boxing is. So my goal, I would say my end game is to try to help be a great advocate for the sport and to bring the sport to a younger generation. Um, you hear a lot of people saying that, you know, it's the old guard that that likes boxing. I think that's not true. I think there are a lot of young people that, that want to get into boxing, that really like boxing, and they need people like myself and other young people to be the voice of the sport. So I'm looking to be the voice of boxing. Do you think you could branch out into other sports? Do you think you'll stay just in boxing or, or move on to others? Well, I've done many sports and, and I was an NBA announcer uh, for several years. Jay-Z hired me to be the voice of the Brooklyn Nets. Um, and I, I did the New Jersey Nets for one season and I did the Brooklyn Nets for their first five seasons in New York. And it was absolutely incredible. And to be calling games every night ringside, you'd have Jay-Z and Beyonce, Rihanna, Paul McCartney, Bill Clinton, David Beckham. I mean, the biggest stars in the world would be there. Uh, sold out nights. I mean, massive, massive arenas calling Kobe Bryant, calling LeBron James, calling Steph Curry. You know, I got to call all these guys. So I did do the NBA. Um, I hosted a TV show for NBC called The Lights. Um, and it was basically uh, NBC's version of SportsCenter. Uh, so I hosted that show. And I've done many other sports. So I, I'm actually really into uh, a lot of sports. But boxing, everyone knows, is my true passion. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a nut. I love it. I want to know when you got that gig. Was it Jay Z that gave you the call? No. So it's well. There ah. was a whole. There was a big. There was a big audition process. There was a big audition process. Um, but there's a great article in the New York Post, and it says Jay Z has found his new voice. And uh, <laughs> so it, it it was great. It was great. You know, you can look it up. But it, it was it was great. But there were over 400 people came out for the audition, and um, you know, I was the last man standing.
Finish the sentence finally on this section. Uh, if you weren't an MC, you'd be what? Traveling around the world on my motorcycle. Yes. How cool yeah. would that be? What? Well, it's, I do it. I've been doing it for the last 20 years. So I just rode through Sri Lanka. I just rode from India up to Pakistan. I just rode through Myanmar. I just rode through Laos. I just did El Salvador. I rode through Haiti, uh, Colombia. Um, I, I go all over the world on my motorcycle, which a lot of people don't don't realize I'm, I'm an adventurer. So um, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've circumvented the globe many, many times. And uh, I hopefully one day will host a wonderful travel show and I can show you <laughs> so many, so many great things around the world. David Diamante, you're living the dream. Right, let's dig into your personal life. This is round four. Um, in your <laughs> spare time, well, we know, don't we, in your spare time, you're gallivanting around the world on your motorcycle. I am. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that. Um, how do you switch off? How do you switch off from all, all the work and everything else? But you know what it is, Anna? I'll tell you, it's, it's, I'm a really, I feel so blessed. You know, people ask, what's my dream job? And I'm living my dream job in many different ways. It's not just the boxing, but also with, um, you know, I owned a cigar lounge in Brooklyn uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and I have my own brand of cigar, the Diamante Cigar. So I, I love cigars and I love the travel and I love the boxing. So I've really taken my passions. You know, I stayed true to who I was. Um, and it all kind of worked out like I, 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 you know, when you play dominoes, there's a, there's a, you know, I don't know if you guys ever played dominoes, but we used to play dominoes back in the day called slapping yeah. bones. And they always say, get in where you fit in. And I just got in where I fit in. I made my own kind of niche in the things that I love. And I never dreamed that it would get to this level. But I just, you know, to me, it's about doing the right thing and doing things day by day. And there's so much that happens behind the scenes, charity events, speaking at schools, volunteering, um, just so many things that people don't see. All they see is you get onto the stage. And a lot of the fans in the UK, they didn't even know me until the Super Series. You know, they started seeing me at the World Boxing Super Series, but I've been announcing uh, close to the last uh, 20 years. And, but you know, with all the, to me- with, I was gonna say with all the traveling you do, I mean, you do a lot in your spare time as well, but with the job, there's a load of travel flying all over the world. Can that perhaps be a downside for your personal life? I mean, it, it takes its toll, I imagine. You know, I'm really fortunate. I have a wonderful girlfriend. She's actually right off camera here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's really understanding and she has a life of her own too. Um, look, there are challenges and, people don't realize all the things uh, that happen. I mean, just as an example, even today, I was driving somewhere and I got a flat tire um, and I had to change a tire on the side no. of the road. That happened today, this morning. But on, when you're traveling, how many times is there a, a, a big storm and you get stuck and then you, know, you have to stay in a, a hotel overnight? And so there's many different things, but you know, it's uh, traveling, there's good and there's bad to everything. You got to take the bitter with the sweet. So you got you got to pay to play. And that's just what it is. We have to talk about your hair, David. We absolutely sure. have to. How long have you been growing it? And, and what made you sort of think, I'm going to grow some dreads? Well, I think we're going to need the 12 rounder for that. But I'll give you the short oh, wow, version. Okay. <laughs> there's a long story. We've got, we've got about 10 seconds. It. Yeah, I've been growing it since 1988. And so I guess 31 years, uh, 32 years, I've been growing my hair. And uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not about your hair. It's about what's inside your head. Oh, I like it. Would you ever <laughs> cut it off, do you think? Or is that, is yeah, that's I mean, you, that, that's your identity, that's who you are? No, to be really honest, I go day by day. I mean, it's, it's literally, I think it's just a part of me. It's, it's, I don't think about it too much, but... I mean, it's like I said, it's just hair. I'm, I maybe cut it tomorrow. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't future trip, so I don't know. I might cut it tomorrow. I might not cut it for the rest of my life. I can't imagine David Diamante without that dreadlocks. It's, it's your thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, the my thing is the fight starts now, and being the oh, voice yeah, of course. boxing, and, and you don't need dreadlocks for that. The fight starts now. What made you come up with that that slogan? And how well, many did you go, love, go through before you came up with that? Well, what I love about it is, so I say to set it up from the four corners of the world to the four corners of this ring right here and wherever we are. 
So for me, boxing is a worldwide sport. So you have people from the whole, all the corners of the world honing in on this ring. So I just, I think it's very poignant. And I came up that, you know, it's, it's all my saying from the four corners of the world to the four corners of this ring, the fight starts now. And that's just one of those things that gets me really excited because it's that moment that we've been waiting for and it brings it all together. And that's it. It's, it's just, it says what it is. There's no mincing. It's not trying to go over the top. It's the fight starts now. It does what it says on the tin, David. Right, let's move on to the fantasy, now, fantasy round. This is round five. Um, if you could MC any fight in the world, what would it be? Of current fighters, let's go. Go for it. Well, you know, it's funny. It's not that I, I never think about it like that. I'm more as a fan which fight I want to see. I mean, Working with Matchroom Boxing and Eddie Hearn, I feel like we do the best fights in the world. So I'm doing all the fights I want to see. And I think there are a lot of great fights that are be coming down the pike, hopefully, that, that we're going to want to see. And, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe that's Joshua Fury. Uh, you know, we don't know what, what those fights will be. But there are so many great fights coming down the pike and so many great fighters that um, I don't really look at it, you know, which fight I, I want to announce. I'm happy to announce any fight as a fight fan. And this is the truth. I mean, I've been doing this, like I said, 20 years. When I first started this, I did it absolutely for free. I never got paid. I did this all volunteer for many years. And that's how I got into the sport. And that's how I ended up knowing the fighters. I knew the trainers. I knew the cut men, the doctors, the referees, the commissions, because I, I, I was in the sport for a long time. And I did it because I loved it. So sometimes those small hall fights, those leisure centers, they'll put on the best fights. If you could go back in time, though, um, and pick any fights, any fighters, any fight you could have watched, any fight you could have emceed. Is there a fight that stands out for you that you would have liked to have seen? Well, been at? you know, I would, I would say, yeah, of course, there, are, there are a multitude. Um, as far as emceeing, I wouldn't want to emcee him because it's, it's not, it wasn't. It to me, I'm about history, and if I didn't do it, then I shouldn't do it. So I'm okay with that. I'm okay with current history. You know, the time is now. The fight starts now. And this is the time. Everyone says, oh, back in the day. No, this is the time. We're alive now. And this is the time. So always, this is your time to shine. And this is my time to shine. And I've got, a, I, 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 you know, God willing, a long career and a lot of great fights to come. But as far as fights that I would have loved to have been at to see, look, can we talk about my, my guy, Sugar Ray Leonard? I mean, obviously, Leonard Hearns, the, 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 that that fight would have been amazing. The the first one, um, Ali Frazier three, the the thrill in Manila. I mean, these are some of the best fights in history. There are a ton. Okay, I'm going to ask you this question. I've asked many many guys doing doing the rounds on on this one. Um, if you could have one superpower for 24 hours, what superpower would you pick and why? Oh, you know, it's funny. I would say to fly. I I probably would just off the bat. I would say to fly, but I have to be really honest. I'm a big motorcycle. I have three motorcycles now, which is that's down from like five, six. I've had a lot of different motorcycles. When I ride a motorcycle, it's like two wheeled therapy and I feel like I'm flying. So I kind of feel like I do have that superpower when I ride my motorcycle, um, but fly. If you could take one person, David, with you to watch a fight, who would that be? Uh, alive or current? Anyone. Or anyone anyone to watch a fight i mean wow so many great people to i mean i've watched fights with a lot of great people i mean i get to watch the fights next to michael buffer so i would say that's probably <laughs> as good as it's gonna get because michael and i we sit you there take that grab me. Some, sometimes he grabs my leg he's like oh my god did you see that i'm like oh my god you know i've grabbed him or hit okay. each other it's really funny um you know, if you ever see us ringside, you know, most people are probably watching the, the action. They're not watching us, but we're hitting each other like, Mike, did you see that? He's like, Dave, oh, my God. So that's really great. You know, he's he's such a great boxing historian. Um, there have been so many of them. But, uh, you know, Thomas Hauser, I've got to watch a lot of fights with him. Harold Letterman, rest in peace, uh, a man that I love very, very, very dearly. And uh, will forget more. He forgot more about boxing than most people in their lives will ever know. Uh, I watched countless fights with Harold Letterman. So I've kind of been schooled by some of the best. And um, this is, uh, I, I think, has helped me uh, gain not just my own perspective, but I get to suck in and be a sponge and shut up and listen to some of these greats uh, talk a lot to me about. I mean, Burt Sugar, I used to sit ringside with Burt. So th there are a lot of great guys 
and great historians that I've watched fights with. I've seen you and Michael do that ringside. It is, it's very yeah. funny to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're right, grabbing each other. Right, final you round. Okay. I know, oh, I know, final I know. round. Here we go. This is your final, like yeah, final start. round. Deep breath, deep breath. Out right. the mouth. Okay, let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> right, you're boxed in essentials. This is all about lockdown. If you could have one item with you in isolation, what would that be? I think it would have to be a laptop these days. I mean, you'd be crazy not to say a laptop, right? As long as you have I mean, a Wi-Fi connection. I mean, we need a laptop for now. Well, the laptop is everything because you can read, you can listen to music, you can watch movies. I mean, I've been watching. I'm a, you know, I'm a huge film buff, and I, I've been watching a ton of Ken Loach films. You know, I'm a huge fan of him, but he's got like 37 films or something. So I'm sitting here watching, you know, Looks and Smiles and Riff Raff and Kess and you know, all these different movies, you know, he's got so many great films. And so uh, watching a lot of film and, and reading a lot of books and listening to a lot of music. So I would say a laptop in these days, a laptop. One film, you just mentioned a few there, one film. Name one film. One film to watch on repeat in isolation, if you could just have one. Oh, there's so many, that's so difficult, but I will say on the waterfront. Oh, good choice. On the waterfront. It's an amazing um, film. One dish. What's your favorite dish, David, to uh, to eat? Oh, out or my mom cooking it? My mom is. Oh, a this is cook. anything. And this is an isolation. You can have uh, whatever you like. You're eating it all the time. Well, I'll kind of go just easy. I mean, I'm a, I like steak, so I'm a steak guy. And uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I do eat uh, quite a bit of like, but good steak, you know. Uh, I like steak, but I'm a, a huge foodie. So uh, I like all kinds of different foods, but I love steak. If you could pick one fight to watch and repeat over and over, which fight would you choose? Maybe it would be the Thrill in Manila, Ali Frazier 3, probably. Fight of the year, 1975. That fight was incredible. Uh, I mean, if I maybe Leonard Hearns won, but I, I think I would say Ali Frazier 3. Thrill in Manila. And if you could pick your boxing hero to spend isolation with, who would that be? Well, so those are two things. My boxing hero or who would I want to spend? Who, which boxer would I want to spend in isolation? What's Oh, my boxing let's hero, go. Well, well, ex um, okay, go on then. So my boxing hero is Sugar Ray Leonard, but would I want to be isolated with him? Not necessarily. So, okay, who <laughs> would I want to be in isolation with? Which boxer? I think there are three different ways I could go with that. So I could look at a guy like Muhammad Ali, who not only is incredibly interesting and charismatic and wonderful, but actually at home, he was the type of guy you could actually really get along with. I mean, he spent countless hours just being quiet, reading the Quran. He, he, he would watch TV. So he was one of those guys that he wouldn't be all up in your face during a quarantine. So I think Ali would be a very good pick. Then you have a guy who's just really just the salt of the earth, like a, a guy like a John Duddy. He would be a great guy to spend in isolation with, just a, a great guy. And then you could go the other way and I could pick, you know, maybe a beautiful female boxer. <laughs> <laughs> I see where you're going with that one, David, right, okay. Um, As finally, I'm, getting, I'm, getting, what, <laughs> I'm getting the looks off camera from my girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, finally, what's, what's the biggest thing you've learned from spending this time in isolation and being locked down in New York? What's the biggest thing you've learned? You know what? Um, I, I feel like I've spent a lot of many, many years on the road and many, many years uh, working on my spirituality and myself. This is not just for boxing, but again, I was talking about those motorcycle trips and it's been a lot of spiritual journeys in my life. And it disturbs me a little bit when people say how bored they are because I have not been bored one moment in this quarantine. And I say that not to, not to, it's just the truth. I mean, there's so much to read. There's so much to watch. There's so much to learn always. Um, there's so much work to do constantly. And I'm just, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a very curious person. I love to learn. And I have found this time to be great. I've been really working on my health. Um, you know, I, I work out quite a bit, but I've been working out more. I've been eating really healthy. Uh, I talk about steak, but I mean, I've been making these health shakes every morning that are just filled with incredible stuff. And I feel really, really healthy. And it's just been a great time. It's a great time to to spend with family and to talking to friends and making connections. And so I'm fine. 
I, actually with being by myself and I'm fine with learning and just being with the book. So I've, it's been, it's for me personally, it's been, it's been fine. You know, I, I, I have absolutely no problem with it. I've led many, many lives. If I don't get to go anywhere else, I've already outdone myself by far. What a brilliant way to end this. David, you've been a fantastic sport. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well. Um, you've been watching David Diamante doing the rounds, doing the rounds. <laughs> Anna, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Voice of Boxing signing off saying, the fight starts now. Yay.